monsters in black hoodies? Maybe not monsters. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Jessica Powell, author of The Big Disruption, a totally fictional, but essentially true Silicon Valley story. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You actually have a very interesting story on how you came upon your, your job, if you will, as in the senior ranks of Google. Talk about your start and your journey uh, to, to your position at Google before you left to write the book. Oh, gosh. Um, how do I make that short? I, uh, I graduated from Stanford um, at a time when a lot of people were going into tech. I went to a job fair. They had like, you know, candy bars and anything for anyone who would hand a, like a resume over to work at pets.com or whatever it might be. And I went and handed my resume out everywhere to get the free candy bars. And then I walked straight out of the, like the place where they were doing it, the job fair. And I instead took myself everywhere but tech. Um, I worked as a journalist and then um, went, saved up, went abroad and just basically took any job I could ever get just because I was constantly moving to different places and just wanting to live in different places and learn different languages and, and stuff and kind of just make enough to, to keep going. Um, and eventually I got to London. And uh, by that point, I had worked as a journalist. I had uh, written a nonfiction book and had also worked in communications. And I applied for every job that fell into those categories. Um, no one wanted me. I applied to CEO jobs. I applied to be a rest, like a waitress. No one called me back for anything. Um, and finally, in a moment of desperation, my boyfriend, then husband, was just like, what about Google? Like a lot of Stanford people work at Google. Maybe just go do that. Um, and I didn't even think to ping those Stanford people. I just sent my resume in from the online form. They called me back. Um, and uh, I think because I'd worked a little bit in communications on copyright and Google was getting sued by a whole bunch of people for copyright reasons, they hired me, uh, or rather I should say, they brought me in for an interview, which I totally bombed. I failed all their questions. It was a horrible experience. Um, and they didn't feed me during a four hour interview, which I still, still resent Google. Um, but they hired me as a contractor. But then once I was hired as a contractor, the joke was on them because they thought they were going to get all the contacts out of me, but I wormed my way in and I got a, 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 like a regular job offer eventually. You had an interesting journey at, at, at Google. And I think, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, you should stay. You should, you know, you've got this great job, but you left to write um, The Big Disruption. What, what inspired you to write The Big Disruption? Well, I'd actually written it before. I was at Google two different times. The first was from around 2006 until 2011-ish. Then I went off and did a startup. And it was while I was at the startup that I actually wrote the book. Um, and the startup was this insane place where we were, it was, it's called Badoo and it's essentially a dating app. But at the time, um, they were, the whole marketing, the whole idea of the company, all the pitch to the investors uh, was that it was about making meaningful connections in the real world. So you just wanted to have a chat with someone online. Um, and, uh, and so the things that we were telling the public very much didn't jive with what you actually saw in the data around like the analytics of what people were doing. Um, we were a hookup app. And then at the same time, everything that we said, you know, we'd tell people, come work for us. We give you free cakes on your birthday and there's, you know, free beer on Fridays and, you know, the usual startup spiel. Um, but at the same time, you'd walk into the office and there might be a picture of a girl on the wall in the, like the product room, or you'd hear someone talking about how women couldn't code all the time. Or one time I walked in and there were dildos on my desk because someone was suggesting that, or someone, uh, the founder was suggesting that, um, Maybe we could use that as marketing swag. So there was just such an extraordinary disconnect between what I felt the, the image we were projecting both internally and externally and what the reality was. And uh, within that environment, I went to a tech conference in Germany called DLD and I watched as founder after founder got up on stage and pitched these huge mission statements as if they were saving the world. And Brian Chesky, who I've heard is a very nice man, got up um, for Airbnb and, um, and basically suggested that if everyone was using Airbnb and we were sharing each other's houses, maybe there'd be less war on the planet. And, and you know, I was like, mm, 
that seems like a bit of a stretch for what generally seems like a pretty cool unregulated hotel business. Um, and it was just, it was in the middle of all that. I get on a flight um, to, to, to go to New York and I'm seated next to another guy from the conference who's an app developer slash copyright philosopher slash poet slash DJ. And I'm like, how did this happen? Like, how did this world and why do we like we're so we're, we're all very young and very lucky and very like how did why do we have this level of influence that we have and is it right that we have this influence and we're such hypocrites on so many like so many levels and so i think i was largely writing and started to write as a way to make sense of my environment i had no sense it was going to turn into a book i had i didn't know how to write a book um it was largely me like vomiting words that's disgusting jessica why did i just say that onto the page for like many pages and then it turned into a book are we past the days when tech companies can really change the world for good i mean i think tech companies are changing the world for good in a lot of ways i mean it's been transformative in a, in a ton of positive ways um i mean like if I even just went through my day to day or yours, there are a million things that we did that we couldn't have done, not a million, but like that we couldn't have done 10 years ago that range from super boring stuff, right? Like a, a password manager or how you got someplace across the city, um, all that kind of stuff using tech has been wonderful. I think, I think the big problem is that a lot of the companies, and this rank goes from big tech down to the startups, the mission, these, this idea, which came from an earnest place, I think, initially, around this idea of these huge mission statements and these values-based statements, um, really overpromised quite a bit, you know, um, that we're going to connect everyone in the world, we're going to give everyone information, we're going to give everyone a platform where anyone can say anything they want. Um, just this morning, I saw a press release from that company I mentioned that I used to work at, where they were talking about how their mission is to solve misogyny, ageism, and I think it was like loneliness and self-doubt. And I was like, you build dating apps. Like, just say you build dating apps. Like, say you have help people hook up or say you want to help people get married, which is probably a stretch. You know, like, maybe leave it at that. Like, let's, you're probably not going to end loneliness and self-doubt with your app. So I think it's just this idea of over-promising and always telling the whole world that you're not a typical company. And so then when all of a sudden the warts start popping out, which were inevitable, um, people are going to hold you to a higher standard because you, the, part of your marketing to the world was that you were different. It sounds like it's not just an issue with the big nine, with the big companies. It's also startups. It's, it's making promises and under-delivering. I mean, I think it's also, you know, in, in defense of startups, and I think about this sometimes because I'm in that world now too, you know, it, it can be hard because I think because of the way all the really big tech companies um, thrived and uh, rallied their employees around these mission statements, I think there's now an expectation to a certain degree that when you're framing your own problem statement, you're pitching to a VC or you're talking to a reporter, it's not enough to say that you're an app that's helping millennials hook up, right? Like <laughs> people don't want to fund that. You're solving loneliness, you know? Um, and so I, like, it, it, I am somewhat sympathetic to this situation that say startups find themselves in, but still the, I think the learning should still be the same for them. Like say what you're doing, don't overpromise, and, and behave in an ethical manner. But isn't that marketing 101? I mean, I mean, you, you're, your background is PR, right? So is right. that something that marketing companies have been doing all along? I mean, should we, should that change? I mean, yes, but at the same time, a lot of the things that are being built are utilities. And if I think of, I don't know, paper towels, right? No one's telling me they're cleaning up oil spills. They're paper towels. They work well. They clean up messes. That's actually transformative in a lot of ways. You know, I have kids, paper towels are wonderful things. Like that's all you need to do. Show me a parent running through the living room, cleaning up after their children with paper towels. And you've kind of, you've got me sold. Let's talk about the big tech companies. Is it possible for a company to become irredeemably, irredeemably too big? You know, I think, I mean, it, it, on a hypothetical level, sure, of, cor of course, of course one can become too big. I think the, the problem too is, that, or the bigger problem is that the companies are only now, they've really, really been slow 
in internalizing the level of responsibility that they have. And I think they've really only hit now, just now, really, this year, starting to realize what that means. And I think that's a problem because that means that historically they haven't prioritized a lot of the issues which they saw as minor consequences of the platforms they built. You know, if I think of Facebook, who's I know everyone's favorite whipping boy at the moment, but somewhat, you know, justified. Um, for the longest time, I mean, it was recently as this year, you'd hear people at Facebook either in you know, public statements or just employees that you'd hear, you know, in the Bay Area talking about, you know, using the kind of logic of, well, with 2 billion users in the world, you're bound to have some bad stuff happen, right? And that's the problem. And that's the kind of the level of moral abstractionism that, that happens in the Valley is that you, you're dealing with things at such scale that you think that this 1% problem that you have, it's 1%. Like who cares about 1% or 0.1%? But when you have that many users, that's a huge number of live stream suicides and like ethnic tensions in Myanmar and electoral interference. I mean, you could go on, right? That, that with really real human consequences, you know, and you could do that exercise with any of the companies and some of the, like certainly any of the platform companies, Twitter, YouTube, and so forth. Um, the, the kinds of harassment that have existed, right? Um, that, that's been there from the very start but no one's really ever effectively tackled it because it always just seemed like a minor problem. How do we, in your, from your perspective, how do we get the tech companies to focus on the bigger issues, focusing less on uh, marketing, you know, tacos to me or products I've searched for on the internet and really focusing some of the bigger issues that plague society? I mean, I think that the, the challenge and where I feel for them a little bit is that now that they're in everyone's crosshairs, regulators, media, and so forth, it's very hard. You know, you look at Libra, for example, Facebook's currency. If they had done that five years ago, right, I imagine people would have been like, wow, that's a really interesting way for people, particularly in the developing world, to move money, right? But now, given their size, it's People are skeptical first and immediately say, wait, what happens when you're no longer working within the traditional banking infrastructure? Um, so I think it's very, very difficult. I think, and, and I think it's, that's okay. Meaning, I think in the end, things are going to be okay. We will move on to a new problem that freak all of us out. And that this is a, like a phase. It, it's a phase and it means that we will be in a new era where tech is going to be much more scrutinized. It will be regulated on some level, the same way that we've gone through that with other industries. I don't think it's ever, I mean, never say never, I guess. It's very hard for me to imagine us going back to the early aughts and that level of kind of love and lava lamp glee and profile stories, sort of sycophantic kind of you know, the rags to riches dorm room or garage kind of origin stories that we've loved about tech. But I also think that's great. Let, let's have tech get a healthy slap on the wrist, start behaving a little bit more professionally. And, and hopefully also that with some of the wave of regulation that may be coming, um, rebalance the scales a little bit, not just for consumers, but also for startups and small businesses. Like, it's a problem in my mind that as that if you're creating a startup today, you're having to pay so much attention to what the big tech companies are doing and that you have to consider as a potential exit path, you have to so heavily consider what acquisition would look like. And that feels like a very different environment than say 10 years ago. And I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's good for competition and I don't think that's good for users. So my hope is that we're all going to end up in a better place and tech will end up in a better place because of what the pain that everyone's feeling right now. If you were brought in from the outside to become the CEO of Anahata, what changes would you make in your first 90 days? I wouldn't change a thing. That company, <laughs> that seems like an amazing place to work. Um, I mean, unless like you're a woman, but they didn't have many of those anyway. Um, uh, gosh, what changes would I make? Uh, I guess it all depends on my goal. If I was aiming for world domination, I wouldn't change a thing. I think they're doing a very good job. You know, I mean, the thing that I was interested in, the big disruption was once I was kind of in my zone of kind of cathartic writing, I was also really fascinated with this idea of how you go from being a company doing one thing 
to a company that's everywhere, right? And so how do you go from being a company that's doing a news feed to then having Instagram and WhatsApp and planes that do internet and having a, you know, uh, free basics in the developing world? And how do you go from being searched to all of a sudden self-driving cars or owning an online bookstore to then going and buying a grocery store? And I felt like a lot of the dominant narrative about tech was very much around data. It still is. It's sort of like data, data, privacy, all the companies want to get your data. And I always felt that if that was actually the end game, you would kind of know how to deal with it. You'd certainly know how to deal with it or have more of a sense of how to deal with it on a regulatory level too. Um, but I actually don't think that's the end game. I think it's more that you just keep expanding. And so if you're doing search and all, of, and all of a sudden you realize that someone can block how you get people to search, you build a browser and you build the browser, but then you realize people can block how you get to the browser. So you build the hardware and you build the hardware, but then you realize what happens if people don't have internet. So you build the cable and you just keep going and going and all these things that sometimes look haphazard or look like a master plan are much more a very clever stumble from one thing to the next and a mix of seeing what other competitors are doing and also feeling like you need to go there. And I wanted to capture that a little bit as well, because I think that actually is much more our reality living in tech than what a lot of um, outsiders kind of say about our industry. What message would you like managers and leaders outside the tech industry to take away from reading your book? Oh, um, well, I mean, I think, you know, people from outside the industry, I want them to be able to laugh and enjoy it. You know, I was trying to write a book that was not, that, that would be funny and, and accessible to people outside of tech, though it certainly has its little sort of Easter eggs for, for people who work in there, uh, who work in the industry. Um, but uh, I think largely I wanted them to, it's going to sound counterintuitive because I think a lot of people think the book is you know, this very critical satire of the, of the Valley. And yes, it is. But I also, you know, I also think it's quite loving in its own funny way it, because those of us working in tech and that are building tech, we're not monsters wearing hoodies. Um, we do wear hoodies, but we're not monsters. We're not monsters drinking kombucha, but we are. Um, like, <laughs> never mind. So we're not monsters. And like, there's so much that's so funny and and lovable and quirky and the people you meet and the conversations you have and the culture that on the whole, even in the bad places, right? And I worked at a horrible place when I was at that startup. Even in the bad places, that general spirit of entrepreneurialism and thinking big and moving fast and challenging notions that have been set in time for who knows how long, I think that's a really wonderful thing. And so I, I did want to celebrate that and wanted wanted people to see that and not just see some kind of minority report dystopia of everyone surrounded by screens and acting like robots. That's a good takeaway. Jessica Powell, author of The Big Disruption. I highly recommend that you pick up her book. If somebody wants to connect with you, Jessica, maybe they want to get a copy of your book. How can they do that? Um, well, I've everything, everything you'd ever want to know and more is, uh, on my site, jessicapowell.co, um, cause .com was taken and it was too cheap. Um, and then, or on Twitter, I, I answer everything on Twitter. So that's at the MoCo, M-O-K-O. There you go. Thanks again, Jessica. And I got a copy of the book. I highly recommend it. It's a really interesting read. If you guys want to find me, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.